Our scripture reading this morning is John 13, 34 and 35. And it says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Uh, Andrew, do you have anybody you'd like to introduce? Welcome. I leaned over to Megan this morning and I said, this, these are my notes on Andrew, everything I have to say about Andrew. And she said, well, what does it say? And I said, it says, Jesus wept. <laughs> for those of you who know Andrew, you know he's a funny guy. Um, for those of us who get to spend a lot more time with Andrew, we know that he's a very serious guy as well. One of the joys that I've had over the last four or five years is just to see Andrew as he came to us from Baltimore, Maryland as an AIM student and then was an AIM student in Salt Lake City and then coming back here to study at Sunset just to see the transformation that has taken place in him throughout the last several years and I know that that's going to continue. Um, as he talks to us, he he talks about, um, and I didn't know he knew about this, but um, definitely Megan and I knew about this, is uh, he came back from Salt Lake City, and uh, Megan came into my office, and she said, I want you to talk to Andrew about coming to Sunset. And I think that that's just an amazing sign of the amazing woman that he has sitting by his side. And um, we're super grateful for you and just the way you supported him. Um, even financially and working while he's in school. And it's just an honor to see both of you two sitting here together. Um, one of the things that brings me a lot of joy is to see AIM students come through AIM, continuing to study in the school, and then get on a team and go and make a long-term commitment to the mission field. And that's what we see with this couple as well as they make plans to um, go to New Zealand and, and work with the churches there and to be part of a team that's forming here at Sunset. And I don't want to take very much of Andrew's time because um, I know how long your lesson is. And so uh, I'm just going to invite you up here to come and preach the word, but we're very proud of you. Uh, wow. Here we are. Uh, I'd just like to start off by thanking everybody for giving me this opportunity. I'm going to kick the cans real quick. Uh, for giving me this opportunity to be here this morning, to be able to present God's Word is uh, always a great blessing. And I'm just really excited to be here. Thank you to the faculty and staff for this opportunity. Um, huge thank you to Megan for being here today. Um, she doesn't have to deal with two-year-olds right now, so she's dealing with the two-year-olds up here. Uh, <laughs> I'd like for all of us to kind of take a moment real quick. I know lots of us have many things going on in our lives right now. Assignments, uh, tests, graduation, um, whatever it may be. I would invite us all right now to focus on God's word. What he's wanting to say in the next two, 22 minutes. Because it's very important for us to kind of take inventory and Make sure that those things that are going on in our life don't get in the way of us worshiping our God. So I, the way I'd like us to do, do that right now is I'd like us to all stand real quick. And then I want to quote this together. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And love your neighbor as yourself. You can be seated for what I have to say. I feel like that's the best way to start off this lesson, is recognizing who it is that we direct our love to. Who it is who we should be directing our life to. And this was the core teaching of the Jews at the time of Jesus. Jesus grew up hearing this, this concept. And he even reiterated this truth in John chapter 13, which we heard just a minute ago when he said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. 
that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is a very important verse for us to keep track of and keep in our minds because this verse gives us an identifying factor of who we are as disciples of Christ. It tells us that people will know that we are disciples of him by the way that we love. Sounds pretty simple, pretty easy concept. It's something that they've been hearing for their whole life is to love the Lord thy God and to love thy neighbor. Then my question for us today is, what makes this commandment new? He says this is a new commandment. So what makes this something new and not just the same old thing that all these guys have been hearing their whole life? And what it is is he tells us, I want you to love even as I have loved you. You see, he gave this commandment to love one another at first, but he says, no, I want you to love the way that I have loved, the way that I have loved you. And so the question that gets brought up is, what is Christ-like love? You know, if we want to be uh, identified as disciples of him, then we're called to love like he loved. Christ-like love is something that I've heard a lot uh, growing up in the church, I've heard that term used many times. And what I want us to do today is to look at what that means in our lives. We'll be, going, uh, we'll be doing that by looking at the examples of how Christ loved the people in his life. Uh, and if you're taking notes, which I know you should be, um, we'll be doing that by looking at how he loved God, how he loved his people, and how he loved all of humanity. And we're going to look at how he is an example for us and how we love. So let's get right into this. And we're going to look at how God, Christ-like love is louder towards God. You see, we see in Christ's life, we see that he is pursuing God in everything that he does. I mean, the earliest example that we see this is him as a 12-year-old boy. As his whole family is going to Jerusalem and they're going to celebrate the Passover meal. And as they they celebrate the Passover meal. They then go and they start to head home and they realize, where's Jesus? And so they travel back to Jerusalem and they're looking for him. For three days they look for him. And they find him sitting at the feet of the priests, of the rabbis, of the people in the temple, learning from them, gaining wisdom from them, gaining that relationship with God and growing and being surrounded by his father. And so they say, Jesus, what are you doing? We've been looking for you for three days. And he was so engulfed, so in tune with his father that his response was, didn't you know I would be in my father's business? This wasn't an arrogant statement. This was him saying, where else would I be? I want to pursue him in everything that I do. My mindset is to be so in tune with my father that his whole everything that he had was to be in him. His whole life was engulfed with the father. We even see how he pursued God when during his ministry. In Luke chapter 5, he went off after healing the sick. He went off to go and spend time with the Father. Now, I'm not going to camp on this for too long, but I think this is important for us to notice as people who are about to go into ministry or people who are in ministry is that there will always be more people to work with. There will always be more people to, to serve. But Jesus made it a priority to leave and go be with his Father. That was the extent of the love that he had for his Father, that God was number one over everything in his life. Even the people that he was serving, even the people that he was healing, I'm sure there were more sick people still there when he left to go be with the Father. But his priority was to be with his Father. The way he pursued the Father reflected in how he loved others. And if we're directing everything that we do with a mindset of glorifying God in the same way that Christ glorified God, then the depth of our love for him 
will guide us on how to love each other. So if we're going to look at how Christ's love is louder towards each other. And when I say each other, I'm talking about those of us who are followers of Christ. Those of us who pursue him have made that decision to be identified with him. And so as we're looking at this, I want us to look at what is that unique identity that we have as disciples of Christ through his love. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everybody who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, then we ought to love one another. Christ came and died so that we could have fellowship with the Father. We are identified through Christ. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We are identified through the Son. The Son and the Father are one, and so we are identified through the love of our God. Because God is love. Christ came and died, and that means that we must identify ourselves with love with each other because we are connected to each other through him, through Christ. We see that unique love through the unity that we have, even in the last moments that Jesus, uh, before he went to the cross, he spent time serving his apostles through prayer, blessing them. He says in John chapter 17, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. So the world will believe that you sent me. The love that we have through identifying ourselves with Christ connects us together in a mutual love for each other. This love shows itself in many ways. It can show itself through encouragement, lifting each other up, blessing each other. Through edification, by directing our hearts and our minds with each other towards God. It even can look like exhortation sometimes. With the mindset of, I love you so much that I want to stay in community with you. I want you to direct your mind towards him and towards what he commands. This is the way that people will know if we follow Christ. is by the way that we love each other. But now we have to ask the question, is the same way that we love each other, the same way that we love the rest of humanity? Now, as we look at how Christ's love is louder towards humanity, I want us to I want to make a clarification that when I'm talking about humanity, I'm t- talking about those who are not yet followers of Christ. We need to ask the question, what does Christ-like love look like for the person who doesn't know Christ? The way that Christ shows love to those who don't follow him from the examples that we see in scriptures, he built, he built an environment where people want to see him. He builds this environment where people want to be around him and to learn more about him. And the great example that I see in this is the way that he reacts to the woman who's caught in adultery. You see, the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus. So they bring this woman who was caught in adultery, throw her at his feet, and they say, according to the law, she should be killed. What do you think, Rabbi? And so what Jesus does is he bends down. He makes some mud. He writes something down. After some time, he gets up, 
he looks around and he says, whoever's without sin, throw the first stone. Then he goes back down and continues writing. After some time, he looks around again. He sees that the people started leaving from the oldest to the youngest. And he asks the woman, has nobody condemned you? She said, no, Lord. Then I do not condemn you either. Go and sin no more. The environment that Jesus created through loving her and showing this unique love to her is he created an environment of safety, an environment of acceptance, and an environment of correction in her life. He created this environment of safety, the safety from judgment, when he bends down and he looks up and he goes and says, whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. In this moment, the safety that she felt is realizing that she didn't get what she deserved. She was caught in adultery, and as soon as they found her, she knew, I deserve to die. They dragged her through the streets to bring her to Jesus. All during that time, she was thinking about her life and how it was about to end. A lot of us didn't get what we deserve through Christ. And I am eternally thankful for that. She got what she needed more than what she deserved. And what the other part of the environment that he created was an environment of acceptance. Now, hear me right when I say this. I'm not saying that he accepted the sin that she did, but he accepted her as a human who has struggles and is going through some hard times. And he looks at her and he says, I don't condemn you. I'm showing grace and mercy to you. And then he made the correction where he says, go and sin no more. You see, love also looks like giving that correction. But you have to build that environment of acceptance because people aren't going to listen if you just say, oh, don't sin anymore. If they don't know Christ, they don't care what that means. They don't care what you say. You need to make them feel accepted, make them feel loved, the same way that Christ loved and accepted people. And then the correction is a part of that as well. Go and sin no more. Leave your life of sin. We're able to see the difference between what she deserved versus what she received. Think about how amazing it is that we didn't get what we deserved, but we received an amazing love. From him. And the most amazing thing about his love is that Christ like love always leads to the cross. The greatest example of Christ like love is shown through the cross. Uh, there's a song in our songbook, and I actually don't know if many people know this song. I only learned it just a few years ago, but it's called For Those Tears I Died. And some of the lyrics in it go like this. Your goodness so great, I can't understand. And dear Lord, I know that this was all planned. I know you here now and always will be. Your love loosened my chains and in you I am free. But Jesus, why me? And Jesus said, come to the water and stand by my side. I know you are thirsty, and you won't be denied. I felt every teardrop when in darkness you cried, and I strove to remind you that for those tears I died. Jesus came to this earth to die for every single one of us, every single one of us in this room. He came to die for me. He came to die for you. He died for that person talking about you behind your back. He died for the liar. He died for that Pharisee who condemned him to death. He died for that guard who put nails in his hand. So let's take a personal inventory. The next time a homeless person walks into our church building, how are we going to react? Next time a church member gossips about you, how are you going to deal with it? 
Next time somebody feels angry because they think their life doesn't matter, how are we going to show them that their life does matter? What if, what if a man and his boyfriend sit next to you in church? How are you going to treat them? Are you going to extend the same love and grace that Christ showed you to them? Because remember, Christ was criticized because he sat with tax collectors and sinners. So who are the tax collectors of our day? Maybe it is somebody who struggles with same-sex attraction. Maybe it is somebody who has been divorced. Maybe it's somebody who's cheated on their wife. It's different for each one of us. We all have a harder time with certain sins. But are we going to show them that same thing? Not what they deserve, but what they need. And what they need is Christ. They need an overwhelming dose of Christ-like love. They will know you are my disciples by the way that you love. So what's the point of all of this? The point is we live in a world that's crying out for love. We live in a world that needs love, that wants love. I'd go as far to say that all of these big, loud movements that we see on the news is a reaction to the fact that they don't feel loved. But they're seeking love in all the wrong places. They're seeking this true love, this magical love, this fairy tale like love that they need and they want. Church, I'm telling you right now, there is a true love. But it's not in a Disney movie. It's only through Jesus Christ. So who will love louder than the cries of the world? As disciples of Christ, we are called to love like Christ. And my desire is that we love louder than those cries of the world. But we need to know what that looks like. I have a slide that I'm about to put up. And once I put it up there, I'm going to sit down. And I'd ask that uh, before Kevin comes up here, let's just take 30 seconds and read this slide. In the blanks, put your name in it. Spend some time taking a personal inventory of your life. If you're like me, your name doesn't fit with everything that's on the screen. Let's grow together. And let's take the next step in loving louder 